Up to this point, from what I've read as well as heard, is the notion that women, whether inherently or as a byproduct of socialization, possess an in-group bias in favor of other women, which seems plausible due to a multitude of factors such as the behaviors of ancestral women, women in contemporary society, and more recent research. However, as looks can be deceiving, I am skeptical about this, and I'll explain why. In my book, The Where of All the Good Men Gone Hypothesis, I brought up Rudman and Goodwin's 2004 study titled Gender Differences and Automatic Ingroup Bias, Why Do Women Like Women More Than Men Like Men? And stated that although the inclination for males to display an automatic ingroup bias was weak, females displayed a strong preference for other females. Termed implicit sexism, in the case of females, they proposed this was due partially to a function of their cognition. Preferences for mothers, a predominance of being cared for by mothers, and associating males with violence were all found to influence a preference in both sexes to favor females. Female identity and high self-esteem also contributed to this ingroup preference. Prior sexual experience, however, was found to increase female outgroup preference in favor of males. The last two sentences here in particular I find to be interesting. There is no question that women will band together as a means to achieve some form of goal. However, we must also keep in mind that individuals are self-interested, which may explain why factors such as female identity, as well as self-esteem, played a significant role in the supposed in-group bias. What I'm hypothesizing here is that the underlying cause of what appears to be a bias in favor of the group is actually a manifestation of individuals prioritizing the self and viewing other women as a reflection thereof. Furthermore, this makes sense of the final sentence. By women sleeping with men, and therefore gaining their favor in some cases, coupled with any ensuing chemical reactions, such as in the case of oxytocin, she may in turn appear more biased in favor of men, but ultimately, this decision will be contingent on her perception of where she can derive the most benefit. This mode of being has been referred to as self-interest bias in multiple studies, and its existence is further bolstered by how women react to male and female cheaters in relationships. Under the exact same circumstances, women are less harsh on one another as it, quote, doesn't exert sexual selection pressure in the same way, it doesn't change male behavior, end quote. In viewing women react with less tolerance to men who engage in multiple partners, one may be drawn to believe that this comes down to a bias in favor of other women, but this ultimately may come down to how this behavior has the potential to affect the individual woman on a personal level. As an aside, but something I found interesting nonetheless, is one potential contributory variable that may have to do with why men did not show the same preference for other men in the in-group bias study. Outside of factors such as other men being perceived as competition, an easily observable one at that, I believe it is very much worth noting that, as heterosexual men are the only group not attracted to their own physical features, this may contribute to their reluctance to harbor a preference for other men. The very human inclination towards self-interest bias greatly dominates rationalization processes and is well worth coming to terms with. In essence, it is the notion that what is good for me must also be good for others. The common saying to treat others the way you want to be treated comes to mind here. This saying in particular I do not agree with as it doesn't consider factors such as neurodiversity and allows the individual to assume, in an egocentric fashion, that they inherently know how to effectively engage with others. A more nuanced approach would be to treat others in accordance with the information you obtain over time by engaging with them. Now as expected, when it comes to biases, the outcome will most likely be rationalization, followed by some form of action. Researchers studying the relationship between self-interest bias and participants' perception of the morality of other people's actions found that, paralleling with their egocentric bias, when perceiving counter-normative acts by others, they were found to be moral only when they benefited from it. This tendency has been referred to as moral hypocrisy, and is further elucidated by the following example. Imagine you're at work, and your boss presents you with two tasks, one you must complete, and one that will be delegated to an unknown individual. There is one task that is easy and may even result in more pay, while the other is quite labor-intensive and does not provide any financial incentive. Which task would you pick? A similar experiment was conducted and to no one's surprise, out of the 20 participants, 16 selected the more beneficial task. The researchers went even further as to allow a coin flip, and even then, only half of the participants took them up on this. At the end of the day, although some expressed it more openly than others, 
humans are self interested creatures. And what the researchers believe this experiment suggests was that individuals battle with their inherent inclination towards selfishness and not wanting to be perceived as such. Quite understandable, as there may be resources to be gained from being perceived in a positive light, and I would suspect has a great deal to do with women's risk averse behavior, as well as unending pursuit of being liked by people around them. Essentially, people do realize that other people have resources they want and therefore must act in a manner they perceive will give them the best chance of acquiring them. This battle in turn results in engaging in behavior referred to as moral masquerade, or engaging in selfish behavior followed by attempting to convince others why the act was not actually selfish. The classic argument of whether the toilet seat should be up or down is an example that comes to mind here, as well as someone in a relationship telling their partner to change a certain behavior because they want to help them, but the underlying goal is actually to allow themselves to feel more secure. To make things even more complicated, an individual may generally believe the request to not be based on self-interest. Not only this, but unethical acts have been shown to not affect perceptions of morality. There is a specific phrase that pops into my head from time to time, and it has for years. That is, people will rationalize what they find to be in their own best interests, and we see this all the time, even in ourselves. This especially applies when we have a natural drive to engage in a specific behavior or set of behaviors. When considering factors such as self-interest bias resulting in an inclination to not only rationalize what one finds to be in their own best interest, but to conceal these acts behind a veil of morality, or not even realize these self-centered foundations exist in certain cases, I have furthermore come to be skeptical of the latent functions of two things. The first one is feminism, and as a caveat, what will be stated I do not believe to be the only latent function, but one of potentially many. Evolutionary theory posits that our distal or ultimate goal is to reproduce, and as has been expressed in certain studies, humans are participating in a marketplace, meaning there will be winners and losers. There are a limited number of options for certain groups to select from when the rules are not in their favor, that is, unless they can change the rules completely. One latent function I've suspected is to alter the marketplace as a means to heighten the perceived marketplace value of less sought after women which would result in them adopting the bulk of the ideology. Lesbians would be another group inclined towards this as, in isolating women from men, there is a potential for them to increase the size of their available partnering pool. Furthermore, by taking over certain high-status forms of employment, they may be perceived of by this pool as a more viable option in satiating their hypergamous inclinations, as well as their own. Additionally, with women's conversation style being based on establishing rapport, which can lead to enabling, this may heighten the tendency found in self-interest bias research that selfish acts committed within groups are considered moral. The second one is regarding an argument made stating that, essentially, if you won't partner with a trans person, you're transphobic. I looked at a couple of studies on trans partnering practices, and although this is not a highly studied field, it does appear that for multiple reasons, dating for them can be rather difficult. In fact, an individual by the name of Dan in one of the studies had the following to say, quote, I didn't have a relationship for many years for several reasons, one of which was because the situation didn't present itself. Secondly, I didn't know what sort of relationship I wanted, and thirdly, I was so shy of my body. I'd had chest surgery quite early on, but it's just a real fear about if someone will accept my body." End quote. With all the uncertainty people commonly have about their bodies throughout their lives, this situation is understandable, and would most certainly hinder someone from engaging in relationships. On top of this, due to these circumstances, their existing prospective partnering pool may be rather small. Now, with regards to the argument made, this is rather interesting from a mate selection standpoint. This, I believe, is based in attempting to heighten one's marketplace value as to gain access to more prospective mates, and as a byproduct of essentially competing in the marketplace with a dominant group endowed with the physical traits you're seeking to reflect, the traits attracting said prospective mates in the first place. If I am correct, it would still not be fair to say that this was a malicious act as, in accordance with what has been stated, an individual may not be aware that their actions are based on self-interest. Regardless of how people want to think of themselves, manipulation and self-interest play a key role in their thought processes and motivations. Whether an individual is a passive or aggressive player in the game of life, they're most likely not as moral as they think they are, regardless of whether they admit it or even realize it. A shout out and thank you to everyone who supported me. And if you got some out of this content, please like, share, comment, subscribe. Consider donating and becoming a patron. And as always, here's to the research and take care.